Welcome to Downpour.com's interview series. I'm Malcolm Hillgartner, and today it's my pleasure to present a conversation with Cory Doctorow. Cory Doctorow is a science fiction author, activist, journalist, and blogger. He's the co-editor of the blog Boing Boing, and the author of many books, including the award-winning young adult novel Little Brother. He is also the former European director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and co-founder of the UK Open Rights Group. Cory's newest novel, Homeland, is now available as a DRM-free audiobook narrated by Will Wheaton at Downpour.com. Welcome, Corey. Thanks for speaking to us. Little Brother was very well received when it came out in 2008, winning the John W. Campbell Memorial Award, Prometheus Award, and White Pine Award, and being named a finalist for the Hugo, Locus, Nebula, and Abraham Lincoln Awards. Last year, you wrote a sequel, Homeland, which you recently published in audio, why did now seem like a good time to return to this world you created and your main character, Marcus Yallo? I hadn't ever intended on writing a sequel to Little Brother. I'm generally not much of a sequels guy. For me, a lot of the fun of writing is discovering a new world kind of lurking in my subconscious. Or you can really think of it maybe as um, making and then solving a puzzle. You know, your subconscious throws up lots of elements of a world as you write the story that are what um, the writer Joe Walton calls in-cluing, you know, things that clue you into what the world is like. And your subconscious is like, well, this would be a cool element for this world to have, and so would this, and so would that. And as you go, another part of your subconscious is kind of chewing on them and trying to figure out how they could all be fit together to make a story, a kind of coherent narrative. How would the world have this and that? That discovery is very exciting, and it's one of the main reasons I enjoy writing so much. And so I don't write a lot of sequels because there aren't as many opportunities for that. But a couple of years ago, I was in New York, and I just had the idea. I think it was probably Occupy that kicked it off because I'd just been down at Occupy and Zuccotti. And um, maybe that's what got my juices flowing. But to be honest, there wasn't anything that really precipitated it so much as, you know, I was out for dinner with my agent and he was saying, do you ever think about doing a sequel to Little Brother? And just as I was about to open my mouth and say, no, you got to be kidding me, I found myself saying, maybe. And then eight weeks later, I had a sequel in hand. Little Brother has been compared to George Orwell's 1984. Are there any other authors who have had an influence on your work? There are a lot of authors who have influenced my work. I'm one of those people who has 10,000 favorite books, not, not 10. And so it's kind of hard for me to sum it all up in, in one go. You know, there's a young adult writer who I really admire named Daniel Pinkwater. And I don't know that you can find any clues so much in my work that show you how much Daniel Pinkwater has influenced me. But given how many times I've reread his books, uh, I think it's hard to claim that he hasn't influenced me. A bunch of friends who are writers influenced me uh, in as much as they got me thinking about writing young adult fiction. People like Justine Larbalastier and Kathy Koja and Scott Westerfeld, who all spoke about the real pleasure of writing for young people and then discussing the books with young people and meeting young people who took the books seriously enough to want to argue with you about them, who really had made them part of their worldview. That's quite an exciting thing. And so, yeah, those writers were definitely a very strong influence on me. I was taught by some very, very good writers, including writers like James Patrick Kelly and Nancy Cress and Damon Knight, and I often return to their advice. And then I've been mentored by other writers who were very, very good to me, like uh, Judith Merrill and Bruce Sterling. So really, it's quite a wide range of writers who've had some influence on me, and I've been lucky enough to collaborate with some of my contemporaries, writers like Charles Strauss and Benjamin Rosenbaum, who've also been very influential on me. Although you are a magazine contributor and a very active blogger on your website, craphound.com, you write fiction, predominantly young adult fiction. What is it about this medium that is appealing to you? Young adult fiction is something that is very exciting as a writer for several reasons. The first one being that the audience really is hungry for fiction that tries to explain the world, not because they're empty vessels in which writers can pour their view of the world, but rather they're kind of answer-seeking machines, young people. They're people who are trying to piece together answers about how the world works and how they can be in it. And fiction is a big piece of how we can tie the world together because it lets you be inside the head of other people as they experience things that would otherwise be um, 
potentially very harmful if you experience them yourself. It's kind of the next best thing to making those dire mistakes yourself and having to learn from them the hard way. And so writing young adult fiction, writing for that audience is, is very exciting for those reasons. I'm also very excited to write young adult protagonists because young adult protagonists are exciting characters per se, I think. Young adult characters, young adult people, are people who are learning to be adults by making mistakes, by trying things for the first time that they've never tried before, literally without any way of being able to predict what the outcome will be. And so you have young adults out there who you know, have never told a lie of consequence or never done something noble for a friend who do so for the first time. And when they do, they do something incredibly brave and really remarkable, something that just uh, trumps most of the risks that we take later in life because it's a risk that you take without any way of predicting how bad it could be if you get it wrong. And so those characters, their lives are full of so much moment that they're a real pleasure to write about and from whose point of view to write. And so writing that kind of fiction is very rewarding. Downpour is very honored to be able to offer the audiobook of Homeland. One of the reasons that the partnership has been possible is that Downpour titles are DRM-free. You are a very strong proponent of removing digital rights restrictions on creative content. Can you tell us a bit more about why you think this is so important? We can talk about the problems with digital rights management from the perspective of readers or from writers, and I think there are some really good reasons not to like digital rights management from those perspectives. You know, as a writer, what the law says is that if I let Amazon or Audible or iTunes lock up my audiobook with their DRM, only they can give you, the listener, permission to take the DRM off again. And so what that means is that if later on Amazon or Audible or iTunes demands terms for me that aren't good, you know, the way they've just done with Hachette, one of the biggest publishers in the world where Amazon wanted deeper discounts and Hachette didn't want to give them to them, if I cut them off, if I say, great, well, I'm just not going to sell through you anymore, you as the listener can't convert your audiobooks to move your library over to whomever I go to next. So really we're kind of guaranteeing Amazon, iTunes, Apple, a perpetual monopoly on audiobooks by allowing our works to be sold with DRM. So I think that's a pretty bad deal for the creator side of things. From the perspective of a listener, well, I mean, for starters, there's lots of things that you can legally do with an audiobook that you can't do because there's DRM on it, like lend it out or leave it to your children. I have books that uh, came from my parents and I have books that I plan to leave to my kid. And the idea that just because it was delivered digitally, it's not mine to dispose of, I think is just wrong. But I think that there's a more important issue at stake here than how the copyright works and who gets to listen and how. Actually, a much more important principle at stake. And that's the principle of being able to determine whether or not there's something wrong with your computer. Because here's the thing, under the laws all around the world, it's against the law to remove digital rights management, and it's against the law to tell people information that would be useful to remove digital rights management. So I'm not allowed to tell you there is a bug in your digital rights management program, and if you install this software, it can exploit that bug to remove the DRM and give you a file that you can move somewhere else. That nominally protects the DRM, but it also means that I can't tell you about bugs in DRM-restricted software and DRM-restricted platforms. So if there's a bug in your iPhone that lets someone watch through the camera or listen through the microphone or grab all your passwords off the keyboard or intercept your other sensitive communications, it's against the law for me to tell you about that bug to the extent that that bug would also help you remove DRM or jailbreak your phone. And as a consequence, security researchers are very leery about investigating and reporting bugs in these platforms. And we've seen an explosion of both crime and government surveillance that exploits these bugs. Uh, governments that use these bugs as a way of uh, installing software on the computers and phones and devices of people they don't like in order to watch them through the camera, listen through the microphone, and track them as well as intercepting their communications. And also sexually exploitative extortionists, criminals who take control of your device in order to capture photos of you in compromising positions and who then threaten to release them to your social media accounts, which they've also captured passwords for, unless you perform sex acts for them on camera. There was just an arrest of over 100 people who were in a gang that was doing this, and each of them had more than 100 victims. Miss Teen USA last year, Cassidy Wolf, was actually exploited by a criminal 
who took over her computer with one of these. And unless you can know what your computer is doing, and unless you can know about the flaws in your computer, you can't protect yourself against this stuff. And that's pretty grave because computers are really the heart of the 21st century. They're our nervous system. We put our bodies inside of computers. Your house, if you live in a modern house, is just a computer. Your body happens to be at rest in. And we put computers inside of our bodies. You know, if you've spent as many hours as I have on earbuds, which you probably have because you're an audiobook fan, then you're going to lose your hearing someday. And so am I. And when we do, we're going to end up with hearing aids. And those hearing aids are not going to be beige, plastic, retro, hip analog transistorized hearing aids. They're going to be computers that live in our body. So it's really important that we get this right. It's really important that we not have laws or incentives that make it illegal for you to find out when there's flaws in the computers that your life depends on in order to ensure that you listen to audiobooks the right way. In order to have more control over the licensing for Homeland, you used some unusual copyright methods, including producing the audiobook on your own. Can you tell us more about the production process? The production process for Homeland, it was a bit rushed. I knew that I wanted to do something with the humble audiobook bundle that was coming up, and I'd spoken to them about it. But when they actually told me what the deadline was, I was pretty unprepared. So I called up uh, my friend Will Wheaton, and I asked him if he'd be willing to read the audio. And he was doing a bunch of other stuff at the time. I think he was pitching his his TV show, The Will Wheaton Show, that's on Sci-Fi now. And so he's flying back and forth from L.A. to New York. But we actually managed to make it happen. He went into Skyboat Studios and recorded the whole audiobook while I was traveling, both for work and with my family. And every day he would go into the studio and record, and then the studio technicians and the the director, Gabriel DeQueer, would send me the audio, and I'd listen to it and give him notes the next day to patch up. We were passing these all to my sound engineer, who does my podcast, uh, John Taylor Williams, who was mastering this as we went. And so it was all pulled together. And meanwhile, I knew that I wanted to get independent audio recorded for the afterwards as well. So Aaron Swartz's brother, Noah, agreed to go into a studio in Seattle, and I helped him find a studio there. And then Jake Applebaum, who's a WikiLeaks volunteer who lives in exile in Berlin because he can't come back to America, found a studio in Berlin. Actually, he um, he went in and recorded in the studio that's run by the guy who used to front Atari Teenage Riot and um, recorded his afterward there. And so it was just a matter of pulling that all together, getting it to John, squeaking it in under the wire, and then putting it up on the Humble Bundle where you were able to name your price for it as well as a whole bundle of other books. And we sold about 40,000 copies that way. Will Wheaton was selected as the narrator for Homeland, and he also has a cameo appearance in the book. Was it just serendipitous that he was cast? How did that come about? Well, I knew I wanted to cast Will for the book, first of all, because I'd heard him read some of my fiction before. He read my story, Scroogled, for the audiobook of my short story collection, With a Little Help. And it's really, hands down, the best reading any of my fiction's ever gotten. And that's really saying something, because my fiction's gotten some pretty amazing readings. Will is a tremendous voice actor. And I'd also heard him narrate Ernie Klein's book, Ready Player One, where he is also a character, as, as am I. And uh, I loved the meta-ness of it. And I'd made Will a character in the book, because I thought that would be fun. And so it all seemed inevitable that he would be the narrator, and he was my first choice. There are many audio clips and outtakes on your blog. Will obviously had a great time recording the audiobook. Were you pleased with how it turned out? I couldn't be more pleased with how this audiobook turned out. I am so proud of it. It's the first one I ever produced all on my own. And really, it's down to the production team. It's really down to the director, Gabriel DeQueer, and the mastering engineer, John Taylor Williams, and of course, down to Will Wheaton. But I was so pleased with how this came out. I couldn't have asked for a better sounding product than this and better acted product. I'm really, really, really happy with it. It is not uncommon these days for the movie rights to popular books to be purchased, but Little Brother was actually produced as a stage play. What was that process like? How was it to see your characters come to life on the stage? Little Brother's been adapted more than once for the stage. I've only seen one of the stage adaptations, the one that played in Chicago, the one that played in San Francisco, which has since been played elsewhere in the world, including in Austria and now is going around the world. I've never actually seen because I live in England and it was mounted in America. And so it was hard for me to time that so that I got a chance to go and see it. 
But my understanding is that it's very good. I've seen videos of it, and I've read the play, obviously, and had a hand in its adaptation. And Joshua Costello, who did that adaptation, is just he's just brilliant. So it was great to see the characters come to life that way. And the other play that I saw, the Chicago adaptation, was also tremendous. It's really an honor to have these creative people put their creative effort into adapting your own work, to, to have them bring their prodigious talents to bear on source material that's your own. And it's an experience that I had with this audiobook too, having someone who's just as talented as Will Wheaton take a go at my book was a fantastic honor. It just left me all aglow. And the same is true with the graphic novel I have coming out this autumn in real life that Jen Wang adapted from my story and his game. And Jen, again, is one of my favorite comics creators. She made an amazing comic called Coco Be Good. And having her turn her hand to my work, wow, what what a treat it was to read it. It's this weird double feeling of, on the one hand, enjoying it as a creative work, as though it had been written by someone else. And on the other hand, feeling this sense of authorship. It's like being the author, but not being the author all at once. Besides being involved in the production of your own works, do you listen to audiobooks? Do you have any favorites? I listen to audiobooks all the time. I actually go to sleep listening to audiobooks almost every night. And my favorites, I think, are the uh, Corgi adaptations of Terry Pratchett's novels read by Tony Robinson. It's a pity that they were abridged. They're all about three hours long, but Tony Robinson is an amazing voice actor, and he really does a terrific job with it. And the Terry Pratchett source material is so good, well, you couldn't ask for any better. I'm also a great fan of a long out-of-print audio adaptation, and that's William Gibson reading his own breakout first novel, Neuromancer. I love hearing Bill Reed, and that is such a great recording. You can find it you know, on the pirate sites, but it's no longer available as a commercial product, and someone should really bring it back. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited about the audiobook release of Homeland. Thank you for joining us for this Downpour.com interview with Cory Doctorow. You can find Little Brother, Homeland, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, and Cory's other titles at Downpour.com.